that one. So we'll start um, number four. We take the divisor, we set it equal to zero and solve. So that's negative seven. And then we'll set up our synthetic substitution. So the first number is negative four. But notice there's no x to the fourths, so I'm going to need a zero there. Then I have x to the third, x to the second, x to the first, and there's no constant term at the end either, so I'm going to need a zero there as well. And then I will just proceed to do my synthetic substitution pattern here. So I'll bring down the first number. Negative 7 times negative 4 is positive 28. We add down. Negative 7 times 28 is negative 196. Is that right? Let's double check. Yep. 196. That's negative 189. We add down. Um, negative 7 times negative 189 is 1323. So when I add down, that's 1321. And multiply that by negative 7. So that's negative 9247. We add down. Oops, it's negative that. And then we multiply by negative 7, and I get my last is 64694. Four. So we add down get that. So again, at the end here, starting at the far right, this is our remainder. That's our constant term our x coefficient, our x squared, our x to the third, and our x to the fourth. So this one was pretty ugly with some wacky big numbers, but that's okay, that can happen. Um, the single biggest place I would expect students have made mistakes to make a mistake is to forget to put the zero there at the end because we're missing our constant term in our divisor. So easy place to have made a mistake. Joe, are you happy with what we did there? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. No problem. So 9 and 10, okay. Um, so number 9, I see something to me that looks suspiciously like a difference of two squares. So I'm going to try to, because I see the even exponent on the x minus a constant. So I'm going to rewrite x to the 6th as something squared. Well, I know x to the third times x to the third is x to the sixth. So x to the sixth is x cubed squared. And then 64 is 8 squared. So if I use my difference of two squares, factor and pattern, I can then write this as x cubed minus 8 times x cubed plus 8. And if I look at each of these, these both look suspiciously like sum and difference of two cubes. Since I see the x to the third and then plus a constant or minus a constant. So I can rewrite x as x or x cubed as x to the third. And I can rewrite 8 as 2 to the third. Right? Because 2 times 2 is 4. And 4 times 2 is 8, so 8 is 2 to the third. So here my a is like x and my b is like 2. Similarly here, 
my a is like x and my b is like 2. So when I plug those into the difference and sum of two cubes factoring patterns respectively, that first one becomes this, and the second one is going to become this one. And then I can simplify some stuff a little bit there. So x squared is just x squared, x times 2 is 2x, and 2 squared is 4. And similarly over in the green one. And that's my final answer. Um, Megan, are you okay on that one? Yes. Okay. So again, that one, you had a lot to do, right? You had three of these special factoring formulas to use between the difference of two squares, and then you had to do one each of the sum and difference of two cubes. Um, if I look at the next one, again, I see an even exponent minus a constant. So I'm thinking that this is a difference of two squares because x to the 8th is x to the 4th times x to the 4th. So I can write that as x to the 4th minus 1, and then x to the 4th plus 1. Now if I look at each of these, this one, x to the 4th minus 1, also looks like a difference of two squares. This one, though, is not factorable, because I know there's no sum of two squares. So x to the fourth, I can think of as x squared squared. And then one is still just one squared. So I have x squared minus one, x squared plus one. And then I still have the x to the fourth plus one. And if I look at these now, I notice x squared minus one is also a difference of two squares. That one is just like our quadratic ones from last chapter. So I can just write that as x minus 1, x plus 1. I still have the x plus or x squared plus 1 and still have x to the fourth plus 1. So this one became those two. And that's my final answer there. Megan, are you okay with that one? Thank you, yes. Great. Um, any more homework questions before we move on? Okie dokie. Well, finish up this set of topics here today. Um, so we've been talking about factoring polynomials. Um, last time, we talked about the sum and difference of two cubes. So the sum of two cubes factoring pattern was this. And the difference of two cubes factoring pattern was this. And then we talked about the difference of two squares. Was this. Okay. So today we're going to look at 
two other factoring techniques we can use, and then kind of put all these together um, into one kind of uh, procedure. So the first factoring technique we'll talk about today is called the quadratic form. So what do I mean by that? I mean something that looks like a times x to the 2n plus b times x to the n plus c. So for example, something like x to the 4th plus 5x squared plus 6 is in the quadratic form is if I look at the biggest exponent, it is twice the middle exponent, and then the last term is a constant. So this is in the quadratic form. And we can really use our factoring techniques from last chapter to factor things like this once we write this as a quadratic. Because right now it's not a quadratic, right? It's got this x to the fourth in here. So the trick is we're going to rewrite that x to the fourth as x squared squared. And we're going to write x squared as x squared to the first. And then we're going to make a substitution. So we'll just pick some other variable, say y, and let that represent x squared. When we do that, we have something that is exactly quadratic. And now we can use all of the techniques that we developed in the previous chapter to factor this. Since the leading coefficient is 1 for this quadratic, I just need to find the two numbers that multiply to give me 6 and add to give me 5. Well, it shouldn't be too hard to see that those two numbers are 2 and 3. And since the leading coefficient is 1, I don't have to do anything to get that in the factored form. But remember, we're supposed to be factoring x to the 4th plus 5x squared plus 6, not y squared plus 5y plus 6. So we're going to go ahead and put our x squared back in for y. And then we just need to check to see if there's any more factoring we can do here. So x squared plus 2 we know is not factorable because there's no sum of squares factoring pattern. And similarly, x squared plus 3 is not factorable because we know there's no sum of squares factoring pattern. So we know that we're finished right here. Let's do another. Let's say we have x to the 8th minus 17x to the 4th plus 16. So I notice that this is in the quadratic form because my biggest exponent is twice the middle exponent. And then my last term is a constant. So I'm going to try to rewrite this now as a quadratic. So I know x to the 8th is x to the 4th times x to the 4th, so x to the 4th squared. 
and I can rewrite x to the fourth as x to the fourth to the first. And now it's quad in the quadratic form. So we'll make a substitution here and replace our x to the fourths with y's. So we can say that y squared minus 17y plus 16. And again, this is quadratic now, so I can factor it like I would have in the last chapter. So two things that multiply to give me positive 16 and add to give me negative 17, which is going to be negative 1 and negative 16. And since the leading coefficient is 1, I can go straight to my factored answer and then put my x's back in. Now I need to check to see if any of these are factorable. If I look at x squared minus 16, this looks like it's a difference of two squares. Right? I can rewrite x to the fourth as x squared squared, and 16 I can write as 4 squared. Similarly, x to the fourth minus 1 looks like a difference of two squares. x squared squared minus 1 squared. So when I factor this, I have x squared minus 4, x squared plus 4. And then I have x squared minus 1, x squared plus 1. And then I should look at each of these and see if any of these are factorable. Well, x squared minus 4 is a difference of two squares, like it would have been in last chapter. So I can factor that. x squared plus 4, though, is not factorable x squared minus 1 is a difference of two squares, like it would have been in last chapter, but x squared plus 1 is not factorable. So there is my final answer. Any questions on these? This tends to be, of the four techniques we're going to talk about, the most challenging one. Okay. Um, the last factoring technique we're going to talk about is grouping. And we can use grouping when we have four terms in our quadratic. So let's say, for example, we have the quadratic x cubed plus 3x squared plus 5x plus 15. So what I'll do is I'll make two groups. From the first group, I'm going to look for a greatest common factor. So that greatest common factor is x squared. When I factor that out, I'm left with x plus 3. From the second group, I'll take my greatest common factor of 5 out. When I do that, I'm left with x plus 3. And if I look at each of these terms, they both have an x plus 3 in common. So when I factor that out, I'm left with x squared plus 5. And then I just need to check to see if I can factor any further. x squared plus 3 is linear, so that can't factor any further. And x squared plus 5, well, is a squared, but it's got a plus sign after it. And I know there's no sum of squares, so I know immediately that's not factorable either. So this is going to be my final answer. Remember, this is just kind of like 
um, we use the same factor by grouping technique in the midst of um, the long factoring for quadratics, right? That's the point when we do the long factoring is we break up that middle term into two terms. So I have a four term that I can use my grouping on. Here we already start with the four terms. So there's not that extra to do. Let's do one more example of this. So we'll start by making two groups. Now notice here that I don't have a plus sign in between. So I'm going to just turn this into plus a negative instead of subtraction. Just like we would have done in the last chapter. From the first group I can take out an x squared, leaving with x plus 4. The second group I can take out a negative 9, leaving with x plus 4. If I look at these two terms, I have an x plus 4 in common. And when I factor that out, I'm left with x squared minus 9. And if I look at these two factors, again, x plus 4 is linear. I can't do anything with that. But x squared minus 9 is a difference of two squares. So I can factor that some more into x minus 3 times x plus 3. Mr. Cooley? Yes, sir. So are you pretty much just trying to get each side to the, to the simplest form it can be? Uh, well, there's not two sides. There's not an equation here. Or, yeah, but like, like the both parts is maybe a better way to say that. So I want this piece to be the same. Okay. When I, sense. Yeah, so that's, that's the key in order to kind of continue doing this factoring is that when we make our two groups and pull out our greatest common factor, the piece that's left has to be the same in both terms. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep, Just like we did in the previous chapter, this is the same factor by grouping that we did when we did the long factoring for quadratics. It's the same technique here. We're just using it to factor a polynomial now instead of a quadratic. So, so to solve polynomials, we're going to get them so they're equal to zero. We're going to factor them and then use the zero product property to set each factor equal to zero. And then we'll solve each of those equations separately. So I'm gonna go back and look at these factoring examples that we've done and just kind of turn them into solving problems so that we don't have to redo the factoring. Um, so we can just concentrate on the solving part. So I'm going to just scroll back up here, and I'm just going to go through these couple of examples as if they were solving problems. So we have a solving problem. It's already equal to zero. So what I would do is I would do the factoring like we did over here to get to using my previous work to kind of shortcut through the factoring part because right now I want to talk about the solving. So I'm going to use these problems that we've already factored 
so I don't have to do the factoring again. If you're doing this solving problem fresh, you would make sure to do the factoring like we did in the example over there for part A. Then using the zero product property, I can set each of these two factors equal to zero. And I can solve each one of them separately. Since they're both quadratic, I know how to do this. I can solve these directly, so I can subtract two from both sides, square root both sides. When I square root both sides, it creates a plus or minus. And because I'm squirting a negative, it makes an I. So I'd write my answer as x equals plus or minus i root 2. And similarly over here, where I get plus or minus uh, uh, i root 3. So once you can factor these things, the solving is not difficult, right? It's just like the solving was in the previous chapter. There might be more of them, right? But they're not any more difficult than the solving problems were in the previous chapter. So let's say we want to... Again, we factor this, so I'm just going to copy down our work. From the previous example. So again, if you're doing this problem fresh, you'd have to do that factoring all over, you know, all yourself. But since we've already done the factoring, I'm just going to Take a little bit of a shortcut and borrow that work so we can concentrate just on the solving part. So now I have one, two, three, four, five, six factors that all are going to get set equal to zero. And I'm just going to solve each one of them separately. So I notice four of those factors are linear things that are very easy to solve. Here I'll just sides. Subtract 2 to both sides, add 1 to both sides, subtract 1 from both sides. And those are all done. That was really easy. Here, this is quadratic, but it's an easy one to do. I can just solve it directly. So I'll subtract 4 from both sides, square root both sides. Because I square root both sides, I get a plus or minus. Because it's a negative, I'm going to get an i, and the square root of 4 is 2. So we can call that plus or minus 2i. Same idea here. When we square root both sides, we get a plus or minus from the square root. We get an i from the negative sign underneath the square root. And the square root of 1 is just 1, so this would be 1i or just i. So those are my answers. So again, the hard part was the factoring part. You notice that when we do the solving, the solvings are usually quite simple. Um, let's do another one. And then I'll do a, uh, a fresh problem here that we haven't done yet. So, first things first, I'm going to do the factoring. In this case, I'm just borrowing what we had done in the previous example. And I can take each of these factors, set them equal to zero, and solve them independently. So when I subtract three from both sides, I get negative three. This is quadratic, but I can solve it directly. So I get plus or minus from the square root to both sides. I get an i from the negative under there, and the square root of 5 I can't do anything with. So 
There's that. So those are my answers there. So again, just gonna my work from the factoring of this problem from this example. I'm gonna set each of these factors equal to zero and solve each of them separately. Um, let's do one more example here of solving where we haven't done the factoring yet. So we'll have to do the factoring inside of this problem. I can't just borrow my work from a previous example to do this. So if I look at this problem, this has four terms, so I should do my factor by grouping. So I'm going to make my two groups. From the first group, I can take out an 8x cubed, leaving me with x plus 1. From the second group, I can take out a negative 27, leaving me with an x plus 1. If I look at each fact or each term, they both contain a factor of x plus 1. So when I factor that out, I'm left with 8x cubed minus 27. And I notice that, hey, 8x cubed looks like a difference of 2 cubes, because I can write 8x cubed as the quantity 2x to the third, and 27 as 3 squared. So here my a is like 2x, and my b is like 3. So when I go and I apply the difference of two cubes, I have a minus b times a squared plus a times b plus b squared. And if I simplify that a little bit, 2x times 2x is 4x squared, 2x times 3 is 6x, and 3 squared is 9. And then I can apply my zero product property to set each of these equal to zero. And I can solve each one of these independently. So I'll subtract 1 from both sides, subtract 3 from both sides, and then divide by 2. And then to solve 4x squared plus 6x plus 9, I can't solve this directly because I have both x's and x squareds in it. So I'm going to have to either use the quadratic formula or to try to factor this. And I'm going to tell you a little tip here. This quadratic part from a sum or difference of two cubes is never going to be factorable. You're always going to have to use the quadratic formula to solve it. So I'm going to just do that. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. So 
So 36 minus 72 is negative 36. And negative 36 creates an i. And the square root of 36 is 6. So that's 6i. And then everything is even here, right? 6, 6, and 8. So they can all get reduced by 2. And there's my other solution. Um, worth pointing out that, again, this quadratic part that we get from the summer difference of two cubes, not only is it not factorable, but its solution is always going to be imaginary as well. So you're always going to get an I when you solve that part. So you can see here that the skills that we developed last chapter in dealing with quadratics, factoring quadratics and solving quadratics, is still really, really valuable, right? How many times have I solved a quadratic or factored a quadratic in the course of this assignment for this lesson? Like a bunch, almost every one of these problems involved some sort of factoring or solving of quadratic skill that we developed last chapter. Um, so that's as much as I want to do today. If you look in the content library in homework three, I have 10 problems that I'm going to ask you to solve by factoring. So the factoring techniques are all mixed up in there. Um, just to kind of review how you would go about doing or figuring out which technique you'd want to use, is if it has three terms, it should be factorable using the quadratic form. If it has four terms, it should be factorable by grouping. If it has two terms, it's either going to be a sum or difference of cubes or a difference of two squares. Um, and that should help you kind of figure things out. We can write that down over here, I guess, in the notes. So again, if you oops, need a little help figuring out which one of these factoring techniques to use in a given problem, the number of terms in the problem is a good giveaway as to what you'd want to do. Okay. Um, any final questions from you guys? Again, the final homework check is on Tuesday at 8 a.m. So the, that homework check will be 5-1, 5-2, and 5-3 homeworks. Um, if you have any other um, missings that you're kind of catching up on, please email me and let me know when I do the homework check to look for those. Sometimes I get going fast and I don't notice that you added something else new. Um, and I'd hate to miss that for you. but. 8 a.m. Tuesday is going to be the last homework check um, and really the last time I'm going to go in and look at your guys' notebooks. So please make sure that you've uh, synced and updated everything you needed to before that time. And I will be clearing um, my content libraries and everything on Friday of next week, the last day of the assessments. So. If you wanted anything from the content library um, or anything else, I'm going to delete the shared notebooks on my end. I'm not sure if that also deletes them on your end. Um, and I'm going to delete the content libraries so that I free up some space on my computer on Friday. And I'm going to have a whole new crop of kids second semester to set this stuff up with. So we will be, uh, just to give you a heads up, that if you have anything in these shared sections that you want to keep, 
you should kind of move those and save those um, into the non-shared portion of OneNote by Friday. So I'll be doing that Friday after the final, or during, probably starting during the eighth exam period. Since I don't have a class, I'll start doing that. Okay. Um, that's all for you guys, or f that's all for me for today. So you guys can go. Remember to type bye into the chat on your way out. And we'll see you guys on Tuesday next week for our final meeting of the year. Calendar year, not school year. And uh, have a nice day. Get some rest this weekend. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kulik. You're welcome.